over the limit. Um, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak on this, uh, in my view, very hot topic, how to separate lung and chest wall mechanics and determine transpulmonary pressure without using the esophageal catheter. Um, I have conflict of interest. I have patents on this new method, and I have shares in a company that uh, is uh, developing these uh, patents. Two years ago, this article was published in New England Journal of Medicine, saying that the airway driving pressure is the most fundamental determinant of survival in the acute respiratory distress syndrome. However, it was just an uh, accompanying editorial that pointed out that this was not really true because the airway driving pressure is the sum of the lung driving pressure and the pressure needed to displace the chest wall. So instead, the relevant pressure is the transpulmonary driving pressure, the pressure that hits the lung. And that is the culprit of ventilator-induced lung injury. Now, the question is, most of us look only at the airway pressure when we do uh, ventilator treatment. And the question is, can we use that to uh, predict what is happening with the transpulmonary pressure? Here is a study by the um, Gattinoni group where they looked at the airway driving pr uh, plateau pressure of 30, which is supposed to be the upper limit of what is uh, acceptable without uh, risk of danger for the lung tissue. And at that pressure, the transpulmonary driving pressure could be 12 or it could be 27. So when you're standing in front of a patient, you cannot say from the airway pressure how much of that pressure that hits the lung. Up to now, determination of uh, the transpulmonary pressure requires the use of the esophageal catheter. This is a catheter that is both uh, complicated and cumbersome to, to use, and it's rarely used in clinical practice. So we started looking at other ways of separating lung and chest wall mechanics. You know that compliance is, is determined as the uh, change in volume divided by the change in pressure. Normally, we calculate, uh, we take the tidal volume and we divide it with the air airway driving pressure and we get the respiratory system compliance. But there are other ways to inflate the lung, and that is by PEEP inflation. Here you see um, the uh, airway pressure and down here, you see the volume by electric impedance tomography. At baseline PEEP here, 10 centimeters of water, uh, zero, zero centimeters of water, we have a tidal volume of 500 and an airway driving pressure of 10. When we increase the PEEP to the same level as the airway driving pressure was at SEEP, that is, we increase PEEP to 10 centimeters, it causes an inf successive inflation of the lung, breath by breath, until you reach a new steady state. It takes about uh, between one to five minutes before such a steady state is reached. This is a PEEP inflation. It causes an increase in end expiratory lung volume. So we have two ways of measuring compliance. We can do it the usual way, the tidal volume divided by the airway driving pressure, in this case a compliance of 50. But we could also divide the delta EELV uh, by the delta PEEP and we get a compliance of 90. That is almost twice. So what is this compliance, the end expiratory airway compliance? What are the determinants of this volume? We looked into uh, a for, uh, previously pap paper that have all the data necessary to calculate. And 
on the x-axis is the delta ALV measured, and on the y-axis is the volume calculated as delta PEEP times the lung compliance. It was in patients with normal lungs, ALI, ARDS, the two extremes of the ARDS syndrome, the pulmonary and the extrapulmonary, and it was in a study where they did PEEP steps from 5 to 40 centimeters. In all these cases, the end expiratory lung volume change was, uh, by the identity line, correlated to the measured delta LV. So we know that the determinant of the, peep step, uh, the delta LV is the size of the PEEP step and the lung uh, compliance. So in this uh, slide, we can see how uh, a very rapid uh, incremental PEEP steps in a lung healthy is occurring, two centimeters at a time, and the red line is the lung PV curve. And as you can see, the overall lung compliance is 153, 4,600 milliliters over 30 centimeters. And in the ARDS, with a baby lung, the same the lung PV curve is 1,600 over 20, the lung compliance is 80. So this is the, the way you buy a PEEP step uh, inflation of the lung can determine lung compliance. The reason for this is we can see more detail. Here we have one, one uh, tidy, uh, PV curve from SEEP and one from 10 in PEEP. And we can see that the end inspiratory airway pressure from the low PEEP is, uh, and the end expiratory uh, pressure from the high PEEP, they are 10 and 15, cent 10 and 15 centimeters each but they are at the same lung volume. So the tidal volume from the low PEEP level is the same as the change in AELV. And this makes it, when you look at this, you can see that this is the lung driving pressure, which is also the delta PEEP. This is the uh, tidal variations in the uh, esophageal pressure. And lung PV curve is hitting the end expiratory airway point of the high PEEP uh, tidal volume. So we can calculate uh, the uh, lung compliance by the conventional way as the tidal volume divided by the transpulmonary driving pressure, or we can calculate it as the delta PEEP divided by the, no, sorry, delta ELV divided by the delta PEEP. The reason for this is the expanding chest wall, very fundamental. The at FRC, as in the left panel here, at FRC, the rib cage wants to spring out and the lung wants to recoil to a lower volume. They cause the net effect is a pleural pressure of minus five. If we increase PEEP, we increase the volume. And when we do that, at end expiration, the spring out force of the rib cage is still working and we are still having a pleural pressure that is very negative, almost the same level as before. It must be remembered that the chest wall has no receptors. The chest wall does not know anything about the pressure inside the lung. It is only reacting on the exterior volume of the lung. So this is why, as we have no change in the pleural pressure between two PEEP levels, all the inflation, the delta ELV, can be divided by the delta PEEP and you can calculate lung compliance. The only thing we have to do is to determine the, different, the delta ELV. And that can be done easily by the ventilator pneumotachograph, which can add the, uh, uh, make accumulation of all the D 
differences of the expiratory tidal volume between two peak levels. This is a very easy procedure, can be automated. So we can calculate C lung as delta EELV divided by delta PEEP. So what are the clinical implications of this? If we look at the pulmonary, uh, this is from a Gattinoni paper back in 2004. We look at the pulmonary ARDS with a direct damage to the lung and the extra pulmonary patient where the ARDS is originating from sepsis and peritonitis. In this case, we, in both cases, we have an airway pressure of 30, but in this case, with the pulmonary, with a stiff lung and a soft chest wall, the transpulmonary driving pressure is 80% of the uh, airway driving pressure. In the extrapulmonary, where the lung is fairly soft and the chest wall is stiff, the, air, the transpulmonary driving pressure is only half of the airway uh, driving pressure. So this is what we want to look at. And once more, to look further into this, this is from the Gattinoni paper, pulmonary and extrapulmonary. The patients show up at baseline SEEP with 40 in lung compliance, no, sorry, in respiratory system compliance, and actually both the extrapulmonary and the pulmonary have the, bow, have the same data, the same airway driving pressure, the same uh, respiratory system compliance. But let's look at the lung compliance of the pulmonary. It's only 50. It's very low. In a normal patient, it's about 100 to 125. The airway driving, the lung driving pres uh, pressure is 13.8 and consists of almost 80% of the airway driving pressure. If we look at the extra pulmonary, the patient has 72 in lung compliance, much more, and the driving pressure, uh, transpulmonary driving pressure, is much lower, only 53% of the airway driving pressure. When we increase PEEP in the pulmonary, we get a further decrease in lung compliance, an increase in transpulmonary pressure, and the transpulmonary driving pressure is now 84% of the airway driving pressure. This is not a favorable uh, response to PEEP. But in the extrapulmonary, we can see that the lung compliance goes up from 72 to 86. The transpulmonary driving pressure goes down to, instead of up, and the ratio the, uh, is still only about half of the airway pressure. The pulmonary patient is a non-responder. It will, it will cause damage when you increase PEEP, uh, whereas the extra pulmonary will be a favorable response to PEEP. So it's very important to find out how it is. Now, by a simple PEEP step procedure, where you change PEEP from the baseline clinical PEEP with 70% of the uh, airway driving pressure, you determine the the lung volume increase during two minutes, then you change back to baseline and determine the lung volume decrease, and then you set the tidal volume to uh, be equal to the uh, delta EELV. When you do that, you can construct a lung PV curve from end expiration at seep to end inspiration at the high PEEP. This looks like this. It's after a PEEP procedure where change of PEEP was from 5 to 10, and the measure delta V was 395 milliliters. So on this curve, whatever you do, change tidal volume or PEEP, the transpulmonary pressure tidal PV curve will move along this. So if we have a 5 in PEEP, this is the tidal uh, inspiration of a uh, volume of about 500 milliliter. So now, if we change to 12 in PEEP, then this tidal curve will move up on the white line. 
that this means that after having done this short procedure, we can predict where, what is happening when we change tidal volume or PEEP in a patient. And actually, this procedure is so easy that a person who can change PEEP can determine and monitor transpulmonary pressure. Thank you for listening.